Um, okay, so today I wanted to just talk about, I thought this would be a profitable sermon and a good reminder for those of you who were here when I preached it, but um, a lot of you weren't here for this sermon and it w- would be, I think, um, useful for you. Uh, so I want to just talk about uh, the evidence of salvation, the evidence of salvation. A lot of people, um, uh, I think, struggle with this because they think they judge the uh, ev- the. Uh, um, the presence of faith the wrong way. Because one, one question we all ask, you know, a lot of people ask is, well, how, how do I know that I'm saved? How do I know that I'm saved? You know, we go out soul winning and many people don't know that they're saved. Many people don't believe you can know that you're saved. You know, you talk to Greek Orthodox and Catholics and they say, no, well, nobody can know. And then, you know, we'll say to them, well, the Bible does say that you can know you have eternal life. And it's here in 1 John 5, 13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So we know that that know there does not mean like we don't scientifically know, like you can't put eternal life into a test tube and then say, you know, this is eternal life. We know because we are promised from a God that can't lie. We're promised by a God that is perfect and holy and his word is, um, is, is 100%. So when we know that if we believe on the name of the Son of God, we know we have eternal life because it is a promise that is promised by God, like it says in Titus, you know, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Um, so because he cannot lie and he's promised it, If we believe on Jesus Christ, we know we have eternal life. But then the next question that comes from that is people will start to say, well then, but how do I know that I believe? You know, and and that's because if I have to believe in order to know I have eternal life, well then how do do I know I believe? And and the reason why people ask themselves this question is because they're actually, uh, without realizing it, you know, they're questioning the genuineness of their faith or the existence of their faith by the wrong factors you know and i'll go through a couple of these factors and let you know uh, why they're wrong so we know you have to believe to have assurance of salvation believe to be saved you know it's not turning from sin it's not keeping the commandments you believe on the lord jesus christ you're saved but then people say well how do i know i believe well one one way that sort of uh one factor that throws people off on whether they, when they ask themselves the questions, well, how do I know I even believe to know that I'm saved? One is the circumstances in which surrounds the moment they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they might look at the circumstances leading up to the moment or surrounding the moment and think, well, maybe the circumstances weren't right. Did I really believe? And they might say something like, well, I don't think I believed the right way. As though there is a right and a wrong way to believe. You know, which, which there isn't. But this is the mindset that some people have. They think, well, I didn't quite believe the right way. Um, let's just go to John, John 10. I'll try and go to all these verses real quick. But we know that salvation is likened to a door, right? Walking through a door. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. So if you think about the analogy of salvation is walking through a door, the circumstances around walking through that door can be different for different people. Everybody might have a different way they got to that door, you know, different circumstances in their life, relationships that they had, ups and downs, to the point, you know, how they even heard the gospel, right? What, you know, where, did they hear about it growing up? Was it somebody that knocked on their door? Did somebody invite them to a church? whatever, but eventually they get to this door, right? But we all, so we all have a different way of reaching the door, but we all get saved the same way in the sense we all must walk through that door. You know, we all must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So there isn't really a right and wrong way to believe because believing is when you walk through that door and we all get there different ways. So the circumstances does not change how you get saved, right? How you actually walk through that door. Some people might say, well, you know, I'm unsure of the exact date and time that I, that I called upon the Lord to be saved. And if you remember in John 3, where Jesus likens, uh, you know, salvation to being born, he says, you know, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. If we take that analogy, we can say, well, a lot of people don't know when they were born physically. 
You know, a lot of people, you know, they don't have a record of the date that they were born. I think my grandma was like that. Nobody really knew when she died how old she was. You know, was she 96, was she 94? Because nobody was 100% sure of her actual birth date. But does that mean that she wasn't born? No, of course she was born because she's there, right? So it's the same with salvation. You know, we may not know the exact date, the exact day, the exact time that we believed, but we know that we believe now, right? So... That circumstance doesn't change whether or not somebody has faith or not. Um, some people might say when they think, oh, I didn't believe the right way, well, they say, well, I, I, I didn't do like an outward or a public or an audible prayer, right? Because we know in uh, Romans 10, 13, you know, whosoever shall call upon the name, name of the Lord shall be saved. And Romans 10 talks about, you know, believing in the heart and confessing with your mouth. So I do believe there must be some sort of calling upon the name of the Lord. But does that mean it needs to be with somebody? You know, does, it, does that mean it needs to be audible? Did it need to be public? You know, could it have been inaudible, but you in your head or in your heart called upon the Lord? But some people think, well, you know what, I, well, nobody, because they might have this idea that there's this right way to get saved. And they say, well, nobody actually came to me. I didn't pray with somebody. I didn't pray the sinner's prayer. I didn't say those exact words. Did I really get saved at that point? Um, this is another reason why people, you know, it's the circumstances surrounding the moment they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. So it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be heard by others done in a certain way. But I do believe that faith is manifested by works. And this is a, a theme throughout the Bible. You know, I believe, therefore I have spoken. We, we looked at, we, we talked about Romans 10, you know, where we believe in the heart, we confess with our mouth. This link between uh, faith and words, not works, faith and, and words. Uh, Luke 6, 45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. It's interesting as well, I don't have this in my notes, but remember Jesus when he talked about being justified, he says, well, in, he says, in that day when every, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So isn't that interesting that it's our words that justify us and condemn us, but we're justified by faith, and we're condemned by faith. It's because words and faith are inextricably linked, because in order for you to believe something, it must be said in your mind. You know, words and faith are like the same thing. When you say, I believe something, it's because in your mind, you have acknowledged and said that that's what you believe. So it's funny that even the people that say, well, no, because you can believe something without words, but you can't even believe that you can believe something without words, without saying those words in your head. Do you see what I mean? So it's, that's why like faith and words are one and the same thing. It's when, when you believe something, it's something that you say in your heart or in your mind. And that's why faith comes by hearing because you hear words and you believe them, you accept those words um, and, and, and speak those words to yourself. So even in, uh, let's say, I'll show you in uh, 1 Corinthians here. Yeah. Because obviously you can't believe something you don't understand. And uh, I'll show you this verse in 1 Corinthians 14 where it talks about speaking in an unknown tongue. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So he's saying, if you're going to speak in another language, um, hopefully that you can interpret that if you're going to speak to somebody in another language. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So you see how, like, if Paul prays in, a, in, a, in another language, but he doesn't actually understand what he's saying, then his spirit is praying, and obviously the Holy Ghost can intercede and translate, but Paul is saying, I, but I don't actually know what I'm praying. So it's like, how, it's the same with faith. Like if you can't articulate what you believe, then how are you believing it if you don't even know what it is that you're believing? It's like, how, how are you saying something here? And when you don't even know what you're saying, you, he just knows that he is praying, but then he's not, doesn't know what it is. Um, what is it then? I will pray with the spirit. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the spirit. I will sing with the understanding also. So I think a sort of a extension of that is that you, you know, you believe. You need to believe with the understanding. Um, otherwise, do you really know what you're believing? Uh, can you really say you believe something if you don't know what it is that you're believing? Uh, another circumstance might be that it wasn't... Um, 
Oh, yeah, I, got, I already said that. You know, it wasn't a physical person who preached the gospel to you. At the moment you got saved, right? So it says here in uh, Romans 10, 14, it says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How, they should, how, shall, how, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? But somebody might think back to the moment they got saved and think, well, I, I didn't have a preacher actually say say anything to me you know i might have read something or i uh or you know i i read the bible some people will say like well i just at the moment i got saved i read the bible and then i believed it at that point or i read a, a gospel tract or i read an article online or something like that or I, I watched a video of somebody it wasn't actually a physical person or i listened to an audio uh, an, an audio and they start to think well do i really believe then because you know these these factors weren't there um, see, do I believe that tracts or written material can lead somebody to salvation? I, I do believe that it is possible. I do believe that it's possible for somebody to read something and that be the thing that, in a sense, reaps them uh, and, and pushes them over the line, gets them to walk through that door. Uh, somebody might say that tracts don't talk. You know, it says, well, how should they hear without a preacher? Uh, one of the interesting things there is in 2 Peter 3.16, when Peter talks about the epistles of Paul, he says here, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. So it's interesting that he says there in his epistles, he doesn't say writing in them of these things, he says speaking in them of those things. Because when you read the epistles, when you read the word of God, it's speaking to you, even though it's not physically a person speaking because you hear the words and the Holy Ghost is speaking those words to you. But people say, well, the tracks don't talk. But they, but, you know, but they say word. They, they can say the word of God. Now, a caveat to that is I don't think somebody, if they're starting from scratch, would necessarily get saved by just reading a material. Not necessarily because it's impossible, but because in Romans um, 3, if we just go there, um, Romans 3.10, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. See, so the problem with just depending on a tract is naturally the natural man does not seek after God. The natural man won't seek after things unless there is a preacher that has awaken them right like god seeks those that are lost by sending believers to go wake people up right and go preach the gospel to them and generally somebody that has been woken up and has that seed sown in them may then i believe go and read something and then that's what pushes them over the line so i don't think people of their own accord in in their unsaved state will seek after god but then god seeks them the message is out there I think the reason why people might read an article, come across something, read a tract, and that's the moment they get saved is because that's just what reaped them. That's not what actually planted the seed and got them actually thinking about it. So there would have been a, a preacher somewhere along the line. And that's generally the case. When you hear about people that got saved reading the Bible or whatever, I mean, they lived in Christian cultures. They knew people that were Christians. They've heard about Jesus. They've heard it before. It's just that what pushed them over the line was that moment in time when they, you know, read that material and then they decided to believe at that point. So that's why, you know, even though tracks, you know, are not as effective as speaking to somebody, that's the reason why it's good to go door knocking and not actually just hand out tracks because it's about being more effective. And, you know, you might leave somebody a track, but without somebody actually engaging that person, they won't necessarily seek after God as though, um, you know, rather than being woken up by somebody that would engage them. So, but just because one method is more effective than another, it doesn't make the other a, a method worthless right because some people think that you know well you know tracks are worthless they're not worthless because obviously you know if you leave it with them this you, you can it can act as follow-up material it can be if there's already like if you didn't get a chance to speak to that person and then they read the tract and it reinforces it that's still profitable it's just they're not as effective as somebody 
right? Somebody preaching the gospel is going to be a lot more effective than just leaving them a piece of paper to read. But the piece of paper with something on there is still, still has its place, can still help somebody, just like articles on the internet can help people, you know, and they've helped a lot of people. Um, it doesn't make them worthless. It just means it's not as effective, obviously, as, as a one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversation. And, and the last one I've got here under circumstances is just, you know, you know, in churches, a lot of churches have altar calls, right? And they say like, well, when I got saved, you know, I just prayed in my seat. I just prayed at home. I didn't come down an aisle and kneel at the, you know, where they call this, uh, you know, they call this area an altar. Um, you know, I didn't get saved that way. Did I really get saved? And of course, you know, that does not mean you have faith or you don't have faith. The, the way or the event that, that you got saved at. It's, you know, I'm not necessarily against, you know, having an invitation at the end of a meeting. I think there are pros and cons. I definitely don't think they should call this area an altar. You know, we don't have altars anymore. And, and you know, uh, in the Bible, we're told not to make altars with steps. You know, so if you were to call this an altar, it's got steps here, you wouldn't even be building an altar correctly. Um, so it's just another method. It has pros and cons. Obviously, you know, some people, uh, like it because it gives the people a chance to get saved. They say it gives them a chance to respond. But, you know, you, you could just talk to people, you know, at church. Talk to them afterwards um, if you want them to respond to the sermon. Like, does a person need to walk the aisle to respond? If somebody needs to walk the aisle to get saved, I mean, are you not putting a barrier there where people might be a bit, uh, you know, self-conscious or they may be shy to walk down publicly in order to be saved? Why would you put that barrier in front of them uh, when it's not necessary? And again, like, you know, our church is not really like this, but, you know, there are some churches where, you know, the preacher is, 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 very, is very emotive in the way that he can uh, explain things and he gets people feeling really emotional. Then they might have music that is really moving. And, and generally, when, when invitations at the end of preaching are given like that, a lot of people make decisions based on the moment and the emotion, how they're feeling, rather than a sober decision of understanding what they are believing when they call upon the Lord. And then that's why they might have doubts later, because they based it on those things. And that's going to be the, the next thing I talk about. So decisions should not be made in the heat of emotion, you know, and, and that's one of the problems with these invitations, not just for salvation, but you might have, uh, you know, a youth camp, or you might have preaching about you know you know committing your life to the lord in terms terms of like you know maybe you have a desire to have an office of a bishop and it makes people make foolish vows and foolish promises where they haven't even met the qualifications they don't even know what it entails and yet they're going to get these 14 15 year old boys promising god that they're going to go full time in the ministry when they they don't even know what it means to get married like they don't know anything yet so these, this is the problem with having these sort of invitations. Um, but, you know, I, 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 don't, I guess they see pros in it because obviously they can ask a lot of people at one time. But um, I personally think the cons outweigh the pros uh, in terms of giving an invitation at the end. And, and that's why I, I don't do them. Because uh, I don't want people making decisions based on um, how they feel. You know, I want people to, to chew on it and digest what has been taught and make a sober, purposeful decision if they want to make a change in their life or if they want to get saved. Okay, so that's one reason. One is the circumstances. So they look at all the different circumstances around the moment they got saved and they think, well, do I really believe, right? Um, but obviously circumstances do not change whether or not faith exists. The second one, and I sort of alluded to it, is an emo emotion. So they might think about the emotions that they had either leading up to or before or after the moment they believed. And they think, well, you know, I just don't feel saved. As, the, as though salvation has a feeling that you can say, if you're saved, this is how you should feel. Um, no, there isn't. So feelings do not dictate whether or not you have faith or not. Or not. Um, so you might not have had some great emotional experience that led you to calling on the name of the Lord. And you might think, well, then do I really believe? Because, you know, I see all these other people, you know, crying and on their knees broken, or I see people really happy. But to me, it was more of an intellectual decision. Like, you know, I, I understood the, the facts. I understood, you know, what, the, what, the, what I'd have to believe and, and how it compared to other things. And, and, and I felt like that, you know, and, I, and then I decided to believe it based on those factors. It was more an intellectual decision for me than it was an emotional one. 
Now, talking about, remember, walking to that door and we all get there in different, different ways, it's the same thing. Like Some people might have taken a more emotional journey that gets them to that door, but if they, if they got to that door based on emotion and they walk through it based on emotion, they're still saved. But somebody might get to that door without emotion. Might be an intellectual reason why they're standing in front of this door and why they walk through that door. And it's very emotionless for them um, because that's not the reason why they made that decision. So it's not that it hinders faith or not. And one, you can have faith and, and, ha and be absent of emotion or absent of intellect for some people. You know, for me personally, I, it was an intellectual decision. I did not have some emotional, you know, and I remember, you know, hearing testimonies of people's life changing and all these things happening. And the moment I got saved, I expected, you know, like, is the room going to shake? Is there going to be a gust of wind that comes in? But nothing changed, right? The only thing that changed is now I have accepted Christ as my saviour. That, that was the only thing that changed for me at that moment. So... A lot of places you'll hear, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on sorrow and conviction. And if somebody understands the extent of their sin, I think, you know, where that helps is it, it can make them more humble. Uh, so we go to 1 Peter 5, verse 5. Um, I'll just read the last bit here. It says, when it talks about, so it says, For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. So it might be that, you know, the more somebody is sorrowful over their sins, they're more likely to receive grace, right? Because the people that are proud and don't think they need a saviour, they're not going to go to God and God's going to be resisting them. But see, I think how you respond emotionally um, depends on other things. You know, it's not actually, you know, it's not that emotion determines that faith exists. It's that emotion, I believe, is the symptom or the result of other factors. And one might be your understanding. I won't turn to all these verses, but, you know, Romans 7, Paul talks about, you know, I had not known sin but by the law. He didn't, see, he didn't know it was wrong until he knew that it was wrong, and then he, then he knew it was wrong, and then he felt bad about it. So sometimes people... Uh, their emotions, sometimes they're not emotional because they don't really realize the extent of their sin yet. They don't really understand, you know, they might know that they're a sinner, they know they deserve hell, but they don't know how, what the extent of, of their sins they are until they start growing closer to God and your sins become more apparent. You, you learn what the Bible talks about and you're like, wow, like I've come so much shorter than I believe. And you'll have moments where you have emotion, but at the time you got saved, might not, be a, uh, might not have been an emotional moment for you. So that doesn't dictate whether or not you have faith. Um, it could be your level of guilt. If you remember that story of the woman that you know, broke the alabaster box, and, you know, she, was that the time she broke the alabaster box? Or did she just come in, she held Jesus by the feet, and she cried, and she wiped his feet with her tears, and remember the, the Pharisee that he was sitting with saying, oh, if he knew what woman this was, then you wouldn't want to be touched by her. Um, and then Jesus tells the story of the, the two creditors, one owed more, one owed little, and who will love the master more when they're both forgiven? And it's the one that was forgiven more. So if you think about it, her emotional response was based on her level of guilt. She knew she was a, she was a sinner, maybe greater than the Pharisees, done more public sins. And, you know, you know, a lot of people assume that she was a prostitute. That's why he's saying if she knew, he knew what type of sinner she was, then he, she, he wouldn't want her touching him. But that's why she has that emotional response. That's why she's crying and wiping her, his head, feet with her tears because she realises how much she's been forgiven. She realises how sinful she is. So when people get saved, realising, you know, and, and it really being apparent to them because maybe they've lived a life that is very socially unacceptable, that when they get saved, they are so uh, emotional because maybe they've done things where people have shunned them off, but then they realise Jesus has accepted them. Um, whereas somebody who d does not, you know, they may have be upstanding in society, so they don't really see themselves as that sinful as the prostitute or the drug addict or whatever, um, but they still realize that their sin warrants hell, they may not have as much of an emotional experience as somebody that has a much higher level of guilt. So crying and tears just equals emotion. It doesn't mean that you have faith and then resulting salvation. Um, and, you know, generally because the gospel is good news, uh, people will have a good feeling, obviously, when, after they get saved. I mean, that's just a general, you know, based on the fact that it's good news, you know, you've been saved from hell, people will feel good. But you know, the amount, what I'm getting at is the amount 
that you feel good is kind of arbitrary. So if people get into this mindset that, well, I measure my, the existence of my faith based on emotion, well, where, where is the cutoff? How, how good do you have to feel until you're saved? You know, or how bad do you have to feel until you're not saved and whatnot? And that's a problem with a lot of these measures is that they're arbitrary. How can you know you have eternal life based on faith if the measure by which you are judging whether or not you have faith is arbitrary? It's, it's relative. You don't really know you have faith unless, you know, if, you, if you're using these factors. Um, a couple of other things, because people will say like, well, if I believe, you know, why am I so depressed? You know, I don't have peace, I'm angry or whatever, I'm impatient, I'm always worried. Um, well, a couple of things, right? You know, um, let's go to these verses real quick. I'll show you just different ones. You know, we see here a theme throughout the Bible is that the, the heart is deceitful. You know, it can't be trusted. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Um, let's go to Philippians. I, I sort of mentioned Jeremiah 17 to you. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Uh, Philippians 4, verse 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So you see that you have to, your heart must be kept you know, it has, to, it has to be kept, um, you know, and your mind must be kept because it can be deceitful, right? And you don't want to necessarily trust in it. It's not something that you put your trust in. It's something that needs to be guarded and kept um, properly. A couple of other things I'll just touch on there is, and one, throughout the Bible, we know that people can feel good without, they can feel good without faith, right? So if if how you feel determines whether or not you have faith, why then can you feel good without faith? Why can you feel bad with faith, right? So you can feel good with faith. You've got pleasures of sin for a season. You've got like Job and in Proverbs talking about the prosperity of the wicked, the pleasures of the wicked. Um, sorry, in Psalms, the prosperity of the wicked. Even in James 5, it talks about, you know, the rich people that God will judge and he's not resisting them right now. He's just letting them because one day they will be judged, right? So people can have a good time. People can feel good. People can be joyful without faith. And also people can feel bad with faith, right? You know, think about like all the things that the apostles went through and think about what, why is the Holy Ghost referred to as the comforter if Christians are never in need of comfort, right? If, if you have faith, you've always got joy. What need is there of a comforter? I don't need to be comforted when I'm always happy, right? I need to be comforted when I'm sorrowful, when I don't feel good, right? Comfort in sorrow. You know, rejoicing was automatic. You know, it's like Philippians. Oh, we're already here. Uh, Philippians 4. 4 it says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, wouldn't that be redundant if it was automatic? You know, if, if we just got saved and we just have the joy of the Lord and it was just automatic, why does it need to be commanded? Like, why is, why is he saying, be joyful, rejoice, if everybody did it automatically? It's because it's not automatic. You know, having joy in the Christian life, walking in the Spirit is not automatic, and that's why it needs to be commanded, because our mind needs to decide to walk in the Spirit. Um... So that was emotion. Emotion does not determine the existence of faith. Third one is desires. So people will say like, well, if I'm saved, why do I have such a strong desire to continue to sin? I thought that when I got saved, you know, um, you know I'm meant to be a new creature. I'm meant to have new desires. And, but, but why that I'm saved? Like, how can I, they'll say something like, how can I be saved when I desire so strongly the things I once did when I wasn't saved? right? Do your desires determine whether or not you have faith? Well, no, because every believer struggles with sin, right? It's a, it's a foolish uh, way to base whether or not you have faith, whether you have salvation and know you're saved based on your desires, because if we look at what the Bible teaches, um, the old man, the old desires are still there, and this is why we struggle with it every day. Um, Galatians 5.16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. See, it's not automatic once you get saved that you just walk in the Spirit. Number one, because it has to be commanded. 
And if you don't do it, you'll fulfill the lust of the flesh. We are commanded to walk in the Spirit. If it was automatic, there would be no need for the command. There would be no need for you know, the majority of the New Testament epistles to exhort us unto good works if they were automatic. automatic right? Well, that, that wouldn't make sense. It would just be just sit back and do nothing and, and the Holy Spirit would just make you do it. But no, this is saying that if you don't do it, you're actually going to sin. You know, you'll, you'll fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's why you need to walk in the Spirit. Why? For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So if you don't understand what happens when you get saved, when you get saved, see, the, mo the moment you sin, your, your spirit is dead, right? Your body's still alive because the soul attached to the dead spirit is still connected, right? It's not until the soul leaves the body that the, the body dies as well. But one day the body will die. Now, when you are born again, your spirit is born again. And that's the new creature. That's what's born of God. But your flesh is still the same. So nothing, when you got saved, nothing changed about your body. Your body's still the exact same body. This is the reason why you sin. The reason why we sin is because this body has desires. This body is what makes you, you know, stressed and get, get, do, does all these different things. It's the flesh that makes us sin. And it's our mind walking in the spirit of God that's born again um, is what makes us keep the commandments. So that's why there's this constant struggle, right? This is what Galatians 5 is talking about. There's this struggle between the, the same flesh that you had before you were saved and this new man that wars against this flesh. And they're constantly fighting. And depending on which one you walk in will become stronger. You know, they, uh, this is something I always learned growing up in, in, in church. Um, well, when, when I started going to church and going to youth group, is they say, well, you can feed the flesh or you can feed the spirit and whichever you feed more will be stronger. Right? It's like if you, it's like they always say, like if you have two pets, you know, and you just fed one dog like all this nutritious food and just fed a lot of meat and you fed another dog like nothing, when these two dogs fight, who do you think is going to win? So it's the same with your spirit and your flesh. If you're constantly fulfilling the lust of the flesh and just feeding the flesh all the time, when the time comes to, for the flesh and the spirit to fight, who do you think is going to win? This is why we need to be feeding the spirit. We need to be thinking on spiritual things, doing spiritual things, um, doing walking in the spirit and feeding the spirit as much as we can so that it can overcome this battle with the flesh. I won't turn to Romans 7, but Romans 7 is when Paul is talking about, you know, this, this inner war that happens where he wants to do the right thing, but then the sin in him wants to do the wrong thing. And there's this constant battle. So if somebody is away from church, they're hanging around the wrong people. They're constantly feeding the flesh with what they listen to, what they watch, what they read, what they do in their spare time. You know, a Christian can get to the point where they quench the spirit and they, you know, they, they just have those same desires and they're stronger because they're not really doing spiritual things. They don't have their mind on spiritual things. So a believer can still have old desires so that doesn't negate the existence of their faith. Um... You know, you, you might have some Christians tell you, yeah, well, when I got saved, I just lost all desire to sin. You know, like some people might say that. And you're just like, what? Are you kidding yourself? Like, are you, are you deceived or something? Because um, look at what it says in James, right? James, I'll show you in James. James 1, where people say, oh, you know, when I, but when, I got sin, when I got saved, it's just like I just never wanted to sin anymore. Well, then my question to them is, why, but they still sin, right? Like, but why do they still sin? Like, if they lost all desire to sin, then they would never sin anymore, right? Why? Because it says here in James 1, read these verses to you, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. See, that's your desire. Your lust is what you desire, and you're enticed because of that lust, right, to, to do something wrong. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So the reason why we sin is because the desire to sin is there. So if somebody says to you, I just have no desire to sin, that means they would never sin anymore because the, the desire to sin would not be there. But they do sin. They would never admit that they're sinless, you know, unless they're totally deceived, you know. 
So the fact that they're sinning means the desire to sin is there. They're just not acknowledging the desire is there. You know, when they say, oh, I just don't have this desire to sin. Of course, the desire to sin is there. Otherwise, they wouldn't be, they would, they, otherwise they wouldn't be sinning anymore. So they're not saying they're sinless. And if they are, 1 John 1, 1.8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So recognizing that sin is wrong does not mean you have no desire to do it right so you might you know you might like recognize that sin is wrong but you still have a desire to do it um so people that say they they don't have a desire to sin anymore they're just deceived because saying that you have no desire to sin is the same as saying you don't sin and first john 1 8 says that you're deceiving yourself if you uh, believe that you are without sin you know, one thing Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, and I'm no Charles Haddon Spurgeon fan by any stretch of the imagination, because Charles Haddon Spurgeon, you know, a lot of people really glorify him as this great preacher, but he preached a hardcore work salvation, a turn from your sin salvation. This is why people like Paul Washer and John MacArthur and Ray Comfort, they all worship Charles Haddon Spurgeon and all these old preachers that preached a turn from your sin salvation, because that's what they believe. If they believe that, and obviously they're going to love preachers that teach what they teach. So if you think if Charles Haddon Spurgeon was so not repent of your sins, and so salvation by grace through faith only, and, and not by, you know, all this works and everything, you know, why, why, do, why do all these preachers that, that preach works, like Todd Friel, Ray Comfort, Kirk Cameron, you know, John MacArthur, Paul Washer, why do they love him so much? Well, they love him so much because they teach what they teach. Right? They teach work salvation, this turning from your sins to be saved. When I think about desires, I always think of this quote from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And um, I remember this quote because this quote was used to try and encourage people at a Presbyterian church I used to go to, to go soul winning. Right? And what Charles Haddon Spurgeon quoted, what, what he said was, Have you no wish for others to be saved? Then you're not saved yourself, be sure of that. Right? So what he's basically saying is, because remember how we talked about the reason why you do something is because a desire is there, right? Because if somebody said, well, I desire to get people saved, and then they never, you know, you know try and get anyone saved, right? Then you, know, you kind of think, well, is the desire really there? I mean, obviously, the desire is not there if you never actually act on it. Same with sin. The sin is there because the desire is there. So if he's saying that you need the desire for others to be saved, I mean, is the next step, or well, you need to go soul winning to be saved? But this is the problem with quotes like this people look to their desires right they look to it because because if, if if somebody is going to take that as truth to say i must desire that other people to other people be saved otherwise i'm not saved that that that's putting a link between your desires and faith so then what other desires do you need to have like do, do you need to desire to read your bible do you need to desire to love others i mean and to, to what extent does this desire need to manifest in order for you to know that you have salvation because somebody what if somebody has has a very small desire but not a great desire to, to actually get some doing it it's just like where, where does it stop this is what happens when you try and judge salvation by works it's just like you know, there is no clear cut you know anymore because there's not just a line that you cross and then um you know that you have faith so, you know, that is wrong. That gets people looking to their desires instead of looking to Jesus, you know, instead of looking to the word to know that they're saved. Um, you know, and, and I, I believe that's just, it's just another form of, of work salvation, you know, saying that people must desire because, you know, how do you then judge that the desire is there, that you're actually doing it? Um, okay, so circumstances, emotion, desires, um, the last one is obviously works. You know, works is the big one, is not, is not evidence of faith. And again, the question must be asked, well, how much works do I need to have before I'm sure my faith exists? You know, a lot of people try and use different verses to say that works are evidence of salvation. Um, I'll just go to two examples, but see, a lot of these, if you were to use them as evidence of salvation it would actually work against you and uh, let me explain like in, in matthew 7 this is another one it says even so um uh it says verse 16 so this is this is a big one right matthew 7 you shall know them by their fruits so people will say like ah see you know you're saved because the bible says you'll know them by their fruits and they're equating these fruits with works i believe these fruits are the things that you say i've talked about that before 
But let's say they say these fruits are works. And you know that you're saved. You know that you have faith because of your works. Um, what well says here, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. So you say, see, if you're saved, you'll have good works, and if you're not saved, then you're going to sin. But the problem is, we have both as a Christian. We're not just all good, right? We have bad. And that's why this, this interpretation falls down, because verse 18 says, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So what this verse is saying is that if you are a good tree as a whole, and you take that interpretation, then you shouldn't be able to sin if you're a good tree because you can't bring forth evil fruit. You should only be bringing forth good fruit. And if good fruit are works, then that means all you should ever have is good works. Basically, you should be sinless. Otherwise, this verse is saying that you're not saved, right? Because this is proving that you're not a good tree since you're bringing forth evil fruit. So some people, they try and say, well, works is evidence of salvation, works is evidence of faith, and they'll come to verses like these, and then they'll say, you know, a tree is known by its fruit. Yeah, well, if we take that standard and actually apply this passage, I'm not saved. So how is that actually helping me to show that I've got salvation? It's just giving me an impossible standard. Uh, another one is in 1 John 3. I think it's... Yeah, I don't know. Here's another one. It says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. So somebody might say, see, if you're born of God, you're not going to sin at all. But is that, is that what we believe? Do we believe that when somebody gets saved, they just become perfect and sinless? No, because we all know that there is sin. We, I mean, Paul even said, you know, I'm carnal, sold under sin. So he sinned as well. So does that mean Paul wasn't saved either? No, we have to understand that. Remember when we talked about the flesh and the spirit, these are the two natures. That's the new creature that 2 Corinthians 5 is talking about when it says, you know, all things have become new. You know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all things, have been, all things have passed away, but all things have become new. All things have become new because the spiritual man, the new man, is absolutely sinless. That's what is born of God. Our flesh is not born of God. Our flesh was born of Adam. It's the flesh of man that Jesus had to take on to die for the sins of the world. And one day, our flesh will be born of God when we're given the new body. But our spirit only is born of God. So that's why there's this idea of the new man, the old man, you know, the good tree, the bad tree, the spirit and the flesh. So people try and use these verses to support this idea. But ultimately, if you did apply those verses in their totality, it would prove that you're not saved. It would prove that you are not born of God because you still commit sin. We still commit sin. So is that what these scriptures are teaching? No, because salvation is by grace through faith. It's not by works. Now, if there was a standard in order to keep, in order to prove that you had faith, you know, the, the Bible talks about it in here, I'll show you here, in, in James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So we know we've all come short from, of the glory of God. You know, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God because the standard of works is perfection. There's, there's no other standard of works in the Bible in terms of making the cutoff to be saved, right? The cutoff is perfection, even in the Old Testament. You keep all the commandments and then you're blessed. You, you break any of them, you're under the curse. So why would it be any different? What other standard can you bring if somebody's saying, well, if works determine uh, the, the existence of faith, what's their arbitrary level? How many works? Because if you were to go to these people that believe that works is evidence of salvation, I mean, if somebody just gave like, a, like 10 cents to, to some Christian charity, you know, as they were like, you know, the Red Cross appeal, they gave 10 cents into that box. Is that enough works? No, for them, that's not enough, right? Because then they want, you know, what they mean by works is, you know, they go into church faithfully, they have a desire to serve God, they have a desire for other people to be saved. That, that's a pretty high standard for most Christians, unfortunately, in this world, right? That's, that's the unfortunate high standard. It should be a low standard. It should just be something that everybody keeps. But in terms of, you know, the, the harvest being plenteous and the laborers are few, like, uh, there's not a lot of people in that category. But 
if, if works is evidence of faith existing, why, why is that not enough? Why is, that, why, is, why is the unseen work that is a one good work that they just did once on a whim, why is that not enough for them? You know, that, shouldn't that be enough to be evidence of, of faith if they just believe you know, there just needs to be how much works? Why is it their level? Why is it not, if it's perfection, then, you, then they can't use that standard anymore. Um, but somebody might say, well, but if the new man does not sin, the new man only does good works, then wouldn't works be evidence of the new man and therefore salvation? That's the logic, right? But th think, think about this. Let me give you some thoughts here. Romans 14, verse 22 says, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So people might say, well, the new man does good works based from what I judge. But then if, uh, so therefore, isn't it then evidence of the new man if I see somebody doing good works? But the thing is, how are you judging whether the works that you're seeing that person do is actually good works, right? So you see somebody give money, you see somebody serving, you see somebody knocking doors or whatever, right? You see somebody doing something that is good. How are you judging that that's a good work? Because you're just judging it maybe by the world standard that it helped somebody. But the Bible says here that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So if they did it not in faith, right? If they did it with the wrong faith motive, then what they did was sin, according to the Bible. Because they, in order for that work to actually be good, it needs to be done in faith. Does that make sense? So you can't just judge somebody's actions and say, oh, they're doing good works, because whether it is actually good or not is based on whether or not they actually are doing it by faith, you know, doing it, believing that they're serving God and not just serving themselves or serving man. So whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So now we're back to square one, right? We're back to, well, if works actually judges whether or not faith exists well you know well if it's bad works if it's not good works, it's sin you're not going to judge faith based on that and if it's good works you judge it based on whether or not they have faith so how then do you judge that to judge their works it gets confusing so you know and you know true good works are judged by faith not the outward appearance we looked at romans 14 um, but, but think of even, you know, Matthew 23. You know, when we think about the Pharisees, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you like unto whited sepulchres, so white graves, you know, these tombstones, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So see these Pharisees, if you were to see them, they would look like they're doing good works. But the reason why they're full of dead men's bones is because they're not doing it of faith. They don't believe, right? And they appear righteous unto men. They appear like they're doing the right thing. But within you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So you don't really, you can't really judge faith by the outward appearance because even the Pharisees, if you were to judge them by their appearance, they would appear righteous. So that brings us back to the, to the same original question. Um, and I'm, I'm coming in for a landing here. Um, so what is the evidence of faith? What is the evidence of faith? Hebrews 11, verse 1. Those of you who have heard this sermon, you know, you know the uh, conclusions. I'm not going to show you here. But if you think of faith, definition of faith, we go to Hebrews 11, 1, right? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, what this verse is teaching here is that faith is evidence, right? So, when we say, what is the evidence of salvation? Faith is the evidence of salvation. But when you say, what's the evidence of faith? Remember how we sort of started there. Sort of, well, how do I know I believe? How do I know I'm saved? Sorry. How do I know I'm saved? It's because I believe. I believe and I know I have eternal life. Some people say, well, how do I know I believe? And we talked about all these factors where people try and figure out, do I have faith? Is faith existent? And there's all these arbitrary factors, circumstances, emotions, desires, works, and they're left wondering still, do I have faith? But what we learn from the Bible in Hebrews 11.1 1 is that faith is actually the evidence. 
So what is the evidence of, of what is the evidence of salvation? It's faith. Now to ask what is the evidence of faith is actually an illogical question because evidence doesn't have evidence. And let me explain, right? Let's say I said to you like, my ring is evidence that I'm married, right? You say, yeah, well, yeah, well, because you know, chances are, you know, and I, obviously the analogy, I could be lying, right? But let's just say, let's just say in every instance, because the Bible says faith is the evidence, and we know that's true. So let's make the analogy that this ring is evidence of marriage. Now, if this ring is the evidence that I'm married, if you said to me, well, what's the evidence of the ring? But it's like, but you don't need evidence for the ring because you're seeing the ring. Do you know what I mean? Like you see the ring, therefore it doesn't require evidence. So evidence is something that you see to determine something you don't see. That's why when they bring evidence before a court of law, it's all the, it's all the facts, right? It's all the things that you can see, the video footage, the testimony. These are all the evidence. This is the evidence of the, of the crime that you didn't see. But if somebody then asks, well, what's the evidence of the evidence? It's like, well, that, that doesn't make sense because the evidence is the evidence of what you don't see. You don't need evidence of what you see, right? And this is why faith is evidence because you see faith. You see your own faith. You don't see somebody else's faith but you see your faith, and that's why we talked about it. Like, because what is faith? Faith is what you believe. You know, you know what you believe because you believe it. You know, they're the things that you say in your own mind. You know it. That's why when, when somebody says, well, how do I know I believe? They somehow have been taught that they are to judge their existence of their faith by these other things, and now they're left wondering. But if you just realize faith is what you believe and you know what you believe because you know what you believe because you know what you believe because you're the one believing it you know that's the evidence that you're saved because you know you have faith you don't need evidence of your faith because you know you have it and faith is the evidence of your salvation the, the fact that you are saved and the bible says you know that you have eternal life so you don't need evidence for your faith when you can see it um, you know, this is why you can knowingly lie to yourself. You can know you're lying to yourself, but you can't unknowingly lie to yourself. That's more like you're deceived. You know, you're deceived into believing something wrong and then you're believing that. But you can't like lie to yourself because you know you don't believe it. Does that make sense? That's, this, that's you're deceived. You're not actually lying to yourself, meaning you don't believe it, but you're telling yourself that you believe it when you don't actually, because you know that you don't believe it. So you don't need evidence for your faith when you can see it, and neither does God, right? God can see your faith. That's why you know you're saved. God knows you're saved. That's why when it says in Romans 4, you know, what shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. So you see, God saw Abraham's faith. You can see your own faith. And that is why um, there is no evidence of faith, because faith is evidence. And that's why when you read this passage, it says, These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. That's how you know you're saved, because you know you have faith, and if you have faith, the Bible says, he that believeth on him hath everlasting life. Anyways, I hope that clears things up for you. Hope that uh, hope you learned something from that. It's always a really interesting topic because a lot of people wonder about the evidence of salvation. And it's interesting that in Hebrews 11.1, 1, we are given the answer, right? Faith is the evidence of things not seen. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord. Thank you for um, your word. Uh, thank you that you give us a lot of clear answers to things that we wonder about. And uh, Lord, I pray that uh, this sermon uh, will help people to have assurance so that they're not looking to their works, they're not looking to circumstances, emotions and desires in order to judge whether or not they are saved. Um, but Lord, they truly are just knowing what they believe and they are purely looking to your promises and knowing that if they believe, your promises are sure. We thank you, Lord, for this, uh, this assurance you give us um, that you know, no other religion can claim. And um, pray, Lord, that you help us to have the desire to share this with others. We pray in Jesus' name.
Amen.